What will you watch and listen for in the next 48 hours? Well, I think there's room for a few more candidates near the top. So I'm watching for the one of the two or three candidates in the next 48 hours who's going to break <clears throat> out of the of the group of people nobody's barely heard of and get into the top. And they'll do it by honing a message that's consistent and easily easy to remember. Anybody who gives eight policy points uh, to, uh, tonight or tomorrow night is going to not make an impression. They, they, they need genuineness and they need a memorable right. moment. Dr. Dean, I spoke with Admiral Sestek of Pennsylvania the other day. He will not be at the debate, but he's a 25th candidate running for president. How do you parse right now the progressive liberal tone of the Democrats versus those in swing districts, swing states, those more moderate? Well, the truth is, I, I, I think this business about progressive and how liberal and all that stuff is a little bit uh, overhyped. Uh, if you actually look at where we won in 2018, uh, most of the seats came from Oklahoma and Texas in the middle of Pennsylvania and Kansas. So that's where the votes are that we're going we're gonna to win. Uh, and I'd, I'd be careful. I think the, the old sort of conservative liberal uh, dichotomy has been pushed, pushed upside down, partly by the Republicans and I think by the Democrats as well. So I'm not so, I don't think it's a matter of how progressive you are. I think it's a matter right. of what you actually have to say, and that's what people are going to listen to. With the House passing the Border Act, the Emergency Border Act, should these candidates tonight, should they touch upon immigration aggressively, or is it a third rail they don't want to go near? I think they should touch upon it. Those pictures of the, of, the, of the guy and his dead daughter face down in the river, that's going to have a galvanizing effect. You know, the American people are pretty decent people, no matter where they are in the political spectrum. That is a picture that shows Donald Trump's policy at its very worst. And I think you're going to see a lot about that. Where do you know where do the policy issues actually go to? If you look at the 2020, you know the, the day of voting, Howard Dean, what will people be thinking about in that booth? They'll be thinking about three things. Uh, one, they'll be thinking about losing their health care to pre-existing conditions, which really hurt them badly in 2018. Two, they don't like Donald Trump. The, ma the majority of Americans think Donald Trump is not a sound president. Uh, and three, they'll be thinking about the economy. What's going to happen to all those people who voted for Trump, who got left behind, whose, po whose position in life has not improved any at all? You can't eat anger for supper, and sooner or later, people are going to figure that out. Right, but, but Governor, if the economy stays as it is, I mean, the, you know, employment's pretty good, the numbers are pretty strong, is President Trump a second-term president, no matter who runs against him? Uh, I think that's probably not right. The biggest problem is the wealth gap, and that is a really big deal. When you have people, people like Eli Broad, who made a fortune in housing, suggesting there be a wealth tax, that's a pretty extraordinary development. Uh, the problem is not that people are uh, suffering and can't find jobs. The, people are, the problem is their wages haven't gone up, and the wages of people who are going up are in the top 1% of the country. And I'm not saying that because I'm a left or a right. I'm just saying that's a fact, and that really drives people crazy because they think they work just as hard as everybody else, and why should they be at the bottom, right. in the bottom 25 or 30 percent? Dr. Dean, I want to go back to first principles. Why are there so many candidates? That's a very good question. I have no idea. Uh, I think they, I actually think Trump has something to do with it. They saw lightning strike a, a, in the Republican Party four yeah, years ago and yeah. figured, why not me? Well, I mean, maybe they said, why not me? But, but here we are beginning. And truly, folks, tonight is really uh, the beginning of the dash. Give us the Howard Dean calendar forward. When do I actually have to begin to concentrate on your insane business? Uh, probably around the 1st of December okay, uh, this you. year. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's pretty much of a parlor game. Oh, but the other, uh, let me just, uh, just, Kevin, I thought, made a lot of sense, but he said a couple of things that I disagreed with. And one is that it doesn't matter what big donors think of the, of the debate tonight. In the Democratic Party, big yep. donors haven't had a whole lot of control over what goes on for quite some time. It's what the grassroots thinks. And those people are, are both ideologically and emotionally already interested in getting somebody who's going to be terrific. And they'll <clears> weigh <throat> in with their $20 donations on the Internet. That's what's going to win this race for the Democrats.
Um, uh, Governor, one of the things that uh, you know I, I was talking about with our Stephanie Baker, who fo you know follows this very closely, is actually how much is the Democratic voter um, looking for someone who they think can beat President Trump versus looking for someone who shares their worldview? It's about two to one. People want somebody who can beat Trump, uh, and, and about twice as many want to vote on that basis, and about one third will vote on the basis of who's most like my view. They're both important, but the, it turns out, and, uh, Nate Silver's done some very good work on this, that about twice as many people, the vast majority of Democrats, just want to beat Trump. Okay, it, usually the polls this far out don't really tell us anything that useful, but is it different this time? Is Biden's lead here to stay? No, it, I mean, it may be, but I, you know, I don't think the polls now, this month, are any better than the polls were. Uh, well, I wish they wish, wish they did because I was leading at this time in 2003. Uh, so I wish I could say the polls six months out were incredibly accurate. I came in, I came in third in Iowa, and that was the, that was you know the beginning of the end for me. So no, everything's going to change, and you're going to really find out what's going on about a week and a half before Iowa.